Shall we begin now? So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the event. We are a part of IEEE graduate student chapter at UT. Today we have a special guest, Leslie Martinet. Leslie is the chair of IEEE TEMS and IEEE Women in Engineering at Austin. In the past, she has also served as the chair of IEEE Central Texas section and was a board member of IEEE Awards. She is an UT alumni and holds master's degree in CS. She began her career as software engineer and further moved into leadership roles for companies such as IBM, Compaq, and several startups. She is the founder and president of Competitive Focus and is also a keynote speaker on innovation and engineering leadership at various international conferences. We welcome you, Leslie, and over to you. Thank you so much. And I'm delighted to be here with you guys. Um, it's really fun to, uh, to be with a bunch of graduate students because I loved my time as a grad student at UT. Um, so I've worked in the software industry in Central Texas for a long time, longer than many of you have been on this planet. Um, and I'm gonna tell you that, I'm gonna tell you right off, I'm gonna do this with no PowerPoint. And it's because I want you to learn that there are ways of doing a, talk, a good talk with no PowerPoint. So that maybe that will be a surprise for you and something new and fun. Um, so let me just jump right in. I, over the years, I have observed that teams often hire people who are like them or a good cultural fit. Uh, they think that this is going to reduce friction and yield a highly productive team. Well, it will reduce friction, but it won't yield a highly productive team. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a team I hired at one time for building an innovative software product that allowed a whole new way of computing. This was really fun, and this was maybe the most fun project any of us had ever worked on. So first off, I hired a woman named Shen. She was from China. She was very sharp. She was very diligent. She was very focused and she would do her research and she would explore everything about the uh, concept of the product we were working on, all the requirements, everything there was to explore. She would do that before she would write her first line of code. And sometimes that made me very nervous. I was afraid she was never gonna get started. But uh, I respected her and, you know, ultimately she did write code, <laughs> so that was good. Um, did I say she was very quiet? She was very, very quiet. Later, I hired a man from Croatia named Boris. And uh, Boris had gone to the same grad school as Shen, and in the, it was in, here in the US. He was also very smart. Uh, he was quick. He was also very quiet. And when Boris had a problem to solve, he would jump in and start trying things out. And that's something that uh, we often call a cowboy coder. Do people still use that terminology? I'm looking for your answers. Poor Rachel. Do people still call others a cowboy coder? I've never that, heard of that, Leslie. <laughs> you've never heard of it? Okay. <laughs> Some young people know what a cowboy coder is, but I didn't know if anybody used that term anymore, but it's somebody who just jumps in and tries stuff out and rather than approaches it in a more thoughtful fashion. Anyway, Boris was on the far end of the spectrum of cowboy coders. So Shen and Boris shared an office. We had offices in those days. And uh, they worked on the same product. And they had a lot of respect for each other, probably because they had attended the same university and probably overlapped a little bit in time in their university careers. Their office was almost always quiet. 
but occasionally it would erupt in this loud, uh, noisy, animated discussion. And sometimes I'd walk by and think, oh my God, they're getting into a fight. But no, they were just solving a problem. And they would, they would sort of shush me away since I was the boss, they'd shush me away and they'd say, so, oh, we're, we're speaking in French because neither of them had English as their first language. So they would just make a joke with me and tell me they were speaking in French. Well, the end result of having these two very different people with very different backgrounds and very different styles. I mean, one who would take forever to get started and the other who would just jump in and make stuff happen was that they finished the product early and it had no defects. And this was a shock to everyone that it would be without defects and early. And it was a complex product. It wasn't just you know something simple. It took maybe six months or, a, or nine months to work on. So uh, why, why was that? Well, when Shen had a problem, she would thought through everything and she was very careful. But if she'd get stuck, she would tell Boris about it. And Boris would just jump in and start trying things out. And he would shake loose the problem. And they'd figure it out pretty quickly. And when Boris got stuck, he had tried a lot of things, but he, he got stuck. And he would be able to tell Shen about it. And she would be able to, uh, she would know right away a different path than the ones he had tried. And she would shake loose the problem. So they're completely different styles of problem solving allowed them to uh, solve problems much faster. This is what I mean by a high, highly productive team. These people could just go and make it happen. So my boss, among others, they were shocked and surprised that we'd finished this product on schedule and with no defects. Well, let me say this. Alone, neither Shen nor Boris would have stood out. Like I told you, they were both very quiet. If they hadn't had each other, as a teammate, they would have just gotten their work done quietly and maybe it would have been defect free, maybe not, uh, but they would have worked hard on it to, to make it what it was. Together, they were rock stars. They were like celebrity engineers. People were celebrating them because they had done something so impressive, produced defect-free code. So um, I want to I want to um, ask you guys if you have any questions about that, and uh, then I'm going to tell you some another story. Okay. Questions? Okay. Well, the point of that story is that they're different backgrounds completely different backgrounds, uh, enabled them to think differently and have different problem solving approaches and do a much better job than if they had been in a group where everyone was the same. So now the second story I'm gonna tell you is about a, a man I worked with for many years, his name is Chip and um, a story about Chip and me. So Chip and I had worked together at a couple of different software companies and we worked on operating systems. So we had a long history and we had a, a good deal of respect for one another, um, but our programming styles were very different. Um, I, you know, I think we did have respect for one another because we'd worked together a long time. We knew each one could produce good results, but Chip's, code, I could barely read Chip's code. It was, he liked to use a lot of recursiveness and to make things really tight. And he probably thought my code was really linear and boring, but you know, we, <laughs> we, we respected each other, but we were completely different in our problem solving approaches. And uh, Chip had an office next to mine. So again, 
days of the offices, long gone. Um, but at lunchtime, uh, he would come over to my office and I would whip out a book that I had. I've given it to my son, who's a software engineer. And um, the book is by an author named Smolian and it's a, he's a logician. And the book title is, what is the name of this book? Which I thought was pretty fun when I was a young logician. So uh, anyway, uh, we, I would get out the book and we'd read a logic puzzle. And then we'd go our separate ways and try to solve the puzzle. And so I would, I would look at the puzzle and I'd come up with a solution pretty quickly. And then I'm done and I'm on, you know, I'm on, back on my work. So the next day we would get back together again in my office and we'd talk about the logic puzzle that we had tried to solve the day before. And so um, I'd have my one quick solution. Chip would come back and he'd have three solutions and a proof. And I'm like, what? Totally overkill guy. But that was his way of approaching the problem. And so uh, I learned that, you know, Chip and I had very different styles and that I was very pragmatic and uh, focused on delivering. And Chip was very research oriented and analytic. I I'm pretty analytic too, but he would just go in and analyze this problem until he had a proof for it. Um, but what I learned was that we made a pretty good team because we were so different. And uh, that, that's just, you know, something that I learned. So that's, um, that's something that I just wanted to, to bring up with you guys. Um, so I want to mention that we just, we saw the world differently. And I've known other people that I've worked with who saw the world differently from the way I see it. We, I was asked at a workshop once, um, name the top things that you've accomplished in the last year. And so I started listing all the products I delivered. And a friend of mine who worked in the same group started listing all the changes she'd made in process. And I'm like, what? This doesn't even make any sense. This is all about, you know, what have you accomplished? <laughs> I've delivered products. You're talking about process? So I learned that she saw the world very differently from the way I saw it. And it turned out that we made an absolutely fabulous team together because we saw things so differently um, that she, if we were looking at a particular problem, she could see it in one way that I would totally miss. And I would see it in another way that she would totally miss. So I learned these things early in my career by observation and by, you know, by doing. I learned by doing this, these things. Later, I had the chance to go out and do, do a lot of research into what makes teams productive, highly productive teams. And it bore out my observations. And that is that having teams with diverse strengths and diverse backgrounds and diverse skills makes for a better, more productive team. And um, so, so a lot of times when companies bring in uh, trainers or workshops on diversity training, they teach you how you can have a more diverse team. You can hire so many people from this area and so many people from that, and you can avoid doing things that are going to be offensive. And that's all the how of having a diverse team. And that's really kind of boring. I'm telling, telling you the why. And the why you want to have a diverse team is because it can be a far more productive team. So 
I want to uh, ask you to think about these things. And I want to note that many of you are young, many of you are still in grad school, you're early in your careers, but you have your own backgrounds, your own styles, your own beliefs, your own problem solving approaches. And you might not even yet recognize how your problem solving approach differs from somebody else's, how your background lends itself to you having a certain way of working in the world. Um, it's something that I have observed in traveling and in working with grad students from lots of different disciplines, that different that people from different backgrounds have different worldviews, different concepts. And that's really important. So what I want to encourage you to do is to think about and pay attention to your approach and your methods and find others who have a different approach, a different background. They're from a different group um, and work with them. And that will help you be the sort of person who is part of a really productive team and you'll be the rock star, you'll be the celebrity engineer, just because you have learned to uh, team up with people who are different from you. So that's pretty much the point I wanted to make um, and, and the talk I wanted, but now I'd like to open it up for discussion. So Kristen has a question. Thank you, Kristen. Any suggestion tips when you're joining an existing team, how to fit into the new team, but still honor your unique background? Well, first it takes time. You have to kind of get the lay of the land. You got to understand how different people in the new team work, who, do, who does what, how, and uh, what their approaches are. And then I would say that it, if you can, it might be useful to say, I always like to team up with people who have a different approach from mine. And I noticed you and I have different ways of looking at the world. So I'd like to uh, engage with you to, to solve some problems together. I know that sounds so hokey. I I'm sorry, Kristen. I'm so <laughs> sorry, it sounds like an idiot, but you have to somehow point out this to them. And uh, if you'd like, I will find the research that says uh, diverse teams are more productive. And you could just say, I've read this research, Here, here's the result. Diverse teams are more productive. I value the fact that you think differently from the way I think. And so I would really enjoy it if we could work together. Does it, how does that sound? Anybody? So uh, there's a couple of things that came to mind as you were talking about that. Um, there is a book called The Diversity Bonus mm -hmm. that talks about this specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're interested in diving into it, that might be one approach. Mm -hmm. The other approach that I've learned is since uh, when I learned, uh, when I graduated from college with a degree in computer engineering, um, the uh, IBM PC was still a gleam in somebody's eye back in the day. I um, remember those days well. <laughs> that's right. And, and the concept of a cell phone was kind of alien. Um, no concept the, uh, the, uh, um, but the thing that I've learned over time is that my focus has moved from hardware and software to uh, people. And so I've been spending much more of my time thinking about user experience design. And one of the things that came up as I was working with various people is the concept of uh, having a cross-generational mentor. Oh, I think that's is, a great idea, Bruce. So find somebody that is one or two generations um, 
different from you. So if you're just graduating uh, from grad school, find a boomer or a uh, Gen X uh, mentor. That, and the goal isn't necessarily to be te- have a technical relationship, but understand their perspective. So it doesn't necessarily have to be another engineer or computer scientist. It's just somebody that has seen the world from that perspective um, very differently than you have. And when you have problems, even with, you know, a coworker or trying to understand um, why people care about things, you can try out ideas and get feedback. I think that is a great idea. What do you guys think about that? Thanks, Bruce. Welcome. I think mentors are a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Senior. Uh, adding to that, I have uh, a question like, can there be a few activities that bring people onto common grounds when we are talking about diversity? You need to have a line where we work together. That's what we focus upon and respecting each other's uh, creativity or uh, whatever they are good at, how, how, how can we do that? Well, you know, I have done that in the past with workshops that illuminate the diversity and do it in a funly, funny way, kind of amusing. Um, but a lot of times groups don't want to, invest the time to do that. Uh, I, you know, it's kind of worth it. Um, when we start getting back together again and in, in, in groups, um, I'll, I will be hosting uh, work workshop meetings with uh, Kristen. She knows about this. She does it all the time. Uh, and that's a topic that we can focus on, that we can do that. So there's a way for you to get that free in one evening in an hour <laughs> here in town. It's, and then you could take it to whatever company you work at, something like that. Um, I mean, it's very rewarding to see that, wow, this person that I, I like actually thinks about things entirely differently than the way I do. And then you can have a respect for that. So I don't know of a way other than, um, other than these workshops or training things to help people develop respect unless they were to read about it, but the reading isn't gonna cut it. You have to actually do it. Does that answer your question? Your question, Nippur? Yeah, to some extent, yes. Thank Not you. a great answer because it involves taking a workshop or class. Yes. But um, are, are you working for a company right now? Are you in grad school? No, I'm an academic, so I'm a postdoc. Oh, postdoc. But, okay. Yes. A postdoc. Yeah. But, well, so you're here in town. Yes. And when we start uh, meeting again at Cirrus Logic, uh, you can come. And, Thank you. Uh, and the, the meetings are always fun and uh, we have an opportunity to learn things. And I think Bruce has been to some of the meetings that I had years ago. Yes, back when uh, Microsoft had a store. Yeah, back when Microsoft had a store at, at the- uh, Domain. Domain, thank you, I couldn't think of the name. So anyway, the other thing that- the other Go thing ahead. that I've discovered on along those lines of, uh, you know, doing exercises and things is uh, there is a group in Austin on meetup that does improv. And mm. that is a fantastic way to break the mold about how you think about things and gain an appreciation um, of the way other people approach problems, even though most of what they do is play silly games it's still activating people's brains and it does it in ways that engineering courses do not. Yeah. And we sometimes at our uh, group at Cirrus Logic, we do uh, leadership improv, which is very much like a regular improv group, but not quite as silly 
and much more about the workplace that you actually experience. Leslie, there's question? a question in the chat. We have a question from Rachel. Okay, do you have suggestions or tips on how to work better with new people in this virtual environment? Yeah, that's a real challenge because it's so much harder to get to know um, the people that you're working with and to know um, what their unique strengths are because it's so much more transactional. You're just transacting, you're just attending a meeting getting a problem up and getting it resolved and you're done with it. Um, I have some comments on that. Good, Kristen, comments. Um, if someone new starts in your group, I recommend you schedule, you know, as much as Slack and IM and all that can help you interact with someone. If a new person starts, I really recommend setting up time with them on their calendar where you guys just meet and chat and make it a low key chat and then have a chat with them every few days where they have scheduled time to just chat with you where you can get to know them, where it's just time to chat and they can ask you questions and you can ask them questions where it's not a focused meeting. And that lets them, you, you, you they can let their guard down, you can let your, your guard down and that helps bring people on board a little bit. It's really hard to start at a new company or in a new group when everything's did online, but this is a, it's a good way to do it. And it's, um, if you schedule it, it's on your calendar and it gives people the ability to let their guard down a little. And at least do it one time by video so they can, you know, you have some interaction where they can see you. And you yeah. can see Rachel, does that help? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you, uh, Leslie and Kristen. Okay, good. So I, I told you guys um, to ask me about my superpowers and you haven't done that yet. So I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> so Wait, you uh, have superpowers? I have superpowers. I know you didn't know this, right, uh, Kristen, but here is something called an Etch-a-Sketch. Many of you are not familiar with an Etch-a-Sketch. But an etch -a sketch allows you to turn a dial one way. Let's see if I can get this out of the glare. And it makes a line and you turn another dial and it makes, uh, one makes a horizontal line and one makes a vertical line. Okay, this is the horizontal line. I don't know, can you see that? Yeah, you can. So that's a horizontal and this is a vertical line, okay. So I have a superpower. Oh, and when you turn a natural sketch upside down and shake it, the whole thing goes away. Um, so my superpower is that I can write in cursive upside down and backwards on an etch sketch. Now I have to do it facing myself, but I'm gonna flip my camera down a little bit, a lot. So you can see, first I have to get the Etch-a-Sketch line right over here to the far right. And then I shake it and make it all disappear. And then I'm gonna write Rachel's name, R. Uh, Leslie, we cannot see what you're Oh, let me see if I can hold it up like this. I'm going to have to do this a little differently. Yeah, push it. Hold it up. R. A. I dare any of you to even be able to draw a flower with this thing. C H E L. 
Now it's not beautiful, but can you see that? That's Rachel's name upside down and backwards. Wow, that's pretty good. If I turn it like that, nope. Oh, if I turn it like that. <laughs> well, I can see it right side up. But anyway, uh, that's my super skill. And as part of your getting to know other people, you can show them crazy tricks that you can do. <laughs> it's always amusing and always fun and it gets it sort of breaks the ice a little bit. And that's just along the lines of getting to know people that you work with uh, in the virtual environment. But that wasn't a good example because it was really hard to see. I know, sorry. So other questions, how, how do any of you recognize what you have that are really uh, exceptional strengths? A way of working? Uh, I think it's much more easier to find the, ne like identify the negative side of ourselves rather than the positive. At yeah. least for me, that, that's how I, I feel. Yeah. that that. That does happen. And I didn't know those things when I was very young. Uh, when I had identified the very striking difference between myself and Chip, I, I was already midway in my career. Uh, but it was around that time that I started to notice that other people were very different from I was. Oh, uh, Bruce talked about um, doing user interface. So I'll just tell you this a little anecdote. When I was a young engineer, I would far prefer writing in assembly language to anything else. And uh, other people would be focused on user interfaces. And I'm thinking, you, <laughs> who wants to do user interfaces? Not me. Um, <laughs> But then I realized I was really glad there were some other people who wanted to do user interfaces. So I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> but you could identify what you really love to do and what you're really interested in and what your, your passion takes you down some research path. You can identify that sometimes and, um, and recognize that you don't like other things. So when you say things, you can identify things you're bad at, um, look at the flip side. What are you good at that's sort of the opposite of that? So I, I knew right away I wasn't gonna be a user interface engineer and I didn't wanna be. Um, and don't hire me for that. <laughs> because I'll probably have some kind of Unix interface where it's all slashes. That's when you need me. That's when I need Bruce because he likes that stuff. I don't like that stuff. And as you um, advance in your career, I think it's really important to understand what you what when you're more, when you're managing other people or supervising other people. It's really important to understand what they love, and give them that to the extent that you can. Um, when I got new employees, when, well, I always hired them myself, but when I hired new employees, I always spent a bit of time, and this is where it's harder to do it virtually, but not impossible, but a bit of time just exploring what they loved, you know, what do they love doing? And then I would try to guide their careers in those directions. If I had projects, that could guide them that way, then I would give them those projects. If somebody on a different team had those projects, I would help them to build the skills to move over to that team. Um, you guys will be supervisors or managers someday, most likely, or you will be supervising the research of another person. And understand what they love and you'll be a better leader. So other thoughts about that? Uh, just asking about leadership when you talked, 
like uh, if you get uh, under you some person who has thoughts just opposite uh, for example let's say that you talk about time management you are very punctual and that kind but you get a coworker under you who is just opposite how do you tackle such situations so if i am the manager and i'm very concerned about time management and i have an employee who isn't is that what you're saying yes maybe some other example i'm just saying that whatever your thoughts are or whatever you consider as this are your positive attitude mm -hmm. or how you work is just the opposite okay um so first of all i just want to understand that and sometimes uh Sometimes, well, the best thing for you to do as a leader is to recognize what they're really good at, the things that they think about, the things that they value, and see if you can make that work. So uh, I mentioned Shen in my first example. Shen was so quiet and so introverted. And I mean, her English skills were not great. She, you know, she came from China. She didn't speak English for that long. She did not want to um, give public presentations. That was just so uncomfortable for her. And at that time in history, companies thought that you had to bring everybody up to the same level on all sorts of things. And one of them was communication and public presentations. And I knew that that was just gonna make Shen miserable. So I tried to get her out of having to take any classes like that and use her for what she was really skilled at. Now what she was really skilled at was very uh, careful and detailed programming. Uh, so if, you know, if the issue is time management and the other person isn't interested in time management, um, then what are they really good at? And are they delivering their work in a reasonable time or are they always waiting until the last minute and then delivering some slipshod work? Um, then it's a, a problem for their career and their employment. But if, if they just value something different from you, then you might be able to look at what they do value and where they do contribute and make good use of that. One of the articles I read that was very influential to me early in my career was uh, called something like Managing the Real Difference. It, it was it's an article that's really hard to find these days because it was from 1988, but it was research about the differences in productivity of individual programmers. This research was done at MCC, which used to be located uh, uh, on balconies and um, Mopac. And the research showed that some programmers were 60 times as fast at finding a problem and solving it than others. So there was this enormous range. Some could solve it within seconds, others might take two days, okay? So that just showed you that there's a huge range. So the authors, a guy named Bill Curtis, um, his point was that if you're a manager, what you want to do is hire those people who are 60 times faster than the others. And yeah, they might be jerks and they might have idiosyncrasies and they might be very difficult to work with. But if you can find those people, uh, you can really have a productive team. And so I took that to heart. I kept a list. I knew I was making a list and checking it twice. I knew who the people were in this town who were 60 times faster than others at, at figuring stuff out and delivering it. When I would move to a new company, I would always hire them if I could. Uh, so 
to say that someone values doesn't value time management, for example, if they can, if they're a high contributor at another in an, in a capacity that maybe they, you know, maybe they don't keep a schedule and maybe they do things in a different way, but if they're still really valuable, then your job is to really manage their skills and maybe you have to maybe you have to put them in a corner so they don't interact with other people because their interpersonal skills are terrible. Um, the guy I told you about, Chip, his interpersonal skills were terrible, terrible. He used to yell at my employees. I did fix him, but um, that took a long time, a lot of work. But I knew that Chip was one of those really high productive developers. And so I wanted to manage that. I wanted to use that. And I just had to work around some of his um, lack of skills. So like when he kicked the desk of the administrative assistant, that was not a good thing. So <laughs> just to give you an example of the kind of crap I had to deal with. Um, but it's important if they are productive, if they're not productive, if the person has no time management skills and isn't productive, they need to not be on your team. Sorry, tough answer. So I've sent you all into the quiet zone now with that, <laughs> that fierceness of mine. <laughs> What are your thoughts? Nupur? Yes, I think it's it's um, it's basically a trade-off between uh, productivity and your employee. So it's all about productivity, I guess, at the end. It is day. it is all about productivity. And maybe there there are times when you have an employee who is not that productive but functions as the glue that keeps the whole group together. And that's an interesting switch. I've had employees who were just not that productive, but somehow their, their presence kept the whole group working more smoothly. Um, sometimes that's a person who has a good sense of humor and can um, diffuse a difficult situation. Sometimes that's how you know you want to use them. Sometimes, if if they're not a very uh, highly paid employee, maybe you just keep them to keep the group functioning at a high level. I had one employee who was in a very low position. Um, something like engineering assistant or something like that. And she was, she, she was hired to sort of keep track of the testing processes, not, not the hugest role. And she would do things that it's sometimes, you know, I'm like pulling my hair out because they seem so crazy and non-productive, but she would do things like she would get a birthday card for each individual in the group. And then she'd take it around to every individual. She'd personally walk it around to every individual to have them sign it. And I'm like, I'm going crazy, but um, <laughs> cause I want to get stuff done. And, and then I realized, okay, well, you know, she has a function. She serves the group in a way of cohesiveness and glue, even though you know, I'm glad I'm not paying her the salary of a regular engineer because, you know, you don't want to be paying somebody a lot of bucks to walk a card around to every individual. <laughs> does that make sense, Nippur? Yes. If, if the person's being paid the high bucks and wasting your time, then really you have to help them find a way to a different group. It's really a question of. I, I have a, a question here um, from someone whose first name I have a hard time with, but Akinola is his last name. 
Uh, so I'm curious about what is the place of mentorship and allowing for growth in your employees? For example, is it possible that the programmer who is not as fast as the 60X fast programmer is just not there yet and would need more delegation of responsibility? What do you think? So I think that's a great question. And I think that's right. So if you have the capacity to be bringing in um, entry-level employees or people who aren't as, as fast as the others, and you can mentor them into a, a great productivity, I think that's a really important thing to do. And uh, when I told you that, when I hired people, I spent a lot of time getting to know them. That was part of the mentoring that I was doing. And then, you know, I would help them find friends who would mentor them as well. Uh, for a while, I worked at Compaq on uh, communication uh, chips. And one of our more senior employees would just sit down with a junior employee who wasn't as productive yet, but he mentored the other guy into uh, becoming one of the most valued employees we had. And it was all about having respect for each other and sitting down and taking the time to you know, show the other person how you're doing your work. And you can do that on video. You can do that with a, you know, looking at the same screens. Um, but I think that's a really important thing to do. And yes, it, you know, I'm, the point about the 60x times productive employees is if you just need a small team to get stuff done, that's great. But if you um, if you if you have a fairly large team and you want to be bringing in new people, you want to be bringing in entry level people because you have to grow them. I mean, you have to grow your team and you can't just hire a bunch of prima donnas at the top when really you need a path, a career path for everybody. Did that answer your question? Thank you, thank you. Uh, Bruce, did you have a question or a comment? Um, yes, but I've uh, lost the train of thought. Oh. I have a comment. Okay, Kristen, is that your voice? Yes, yeah. and maybe uh, Leslie and Bruce might wanna add on uh, someone brought up mentorship. I'd like to add that um, you should look for all kinds of mentors. You should have mentors that are technically superior to you. You should have mentors that are peers to you. You should have mentors that are less technical than you. You should have mentors in, men in management. You should have mentors that are older and younger in, than you, that are in different fields than you. Um, you can never have too many mentors and you should have all kinds of mentors to help you with your career. That would be uh, some advice I would pass on. And I, I, I think Bruce and Leslie could probably comment on that as well. The other comment I would make to that is that uh you should also be one to them. Yeah, true. And just so you guys know, I am always willing to be a mentor. Um, I, I mentor people all around the world. And some people took my classes 10 years ago and uh, they still keep in touch with me. I just got a picture from one guy that I worked with 10 years ago who's English language skills were abysmal, just abysmal. And he had to write stuff. And I had to tell him, you know, you gotta, you gotta have somebody else look at this and edit it um, because it's really going to keep you behind in your career. And he grew up in the United States. He just had not good English language education. He had good other education. He sent me a picture of his baby today. I thought that was so sweet. So I have uh, people that I mentor for many, many, many years. And sometimes I don't hear from them for 10 years and then they pop up and I'm happy to hear back from them. So if any of you want to mentor, I'm raising my hand. Just... 
I think you can find me. Leslie Martinich is a pretty easy name to track down. Pretty sure there's only one in the world. Um, does anyone have any questions for Leslie? So I guess, um, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. And it was interesting to know about your experiences, the story, listen about your stories, and most important, knowing your power. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can show my power really well on a whiteboard that I can write upside down and backwards in cursive. <laughs> we'll be glad uh, to watch it sometime. Yeah. And often when I go to give a talk in a foreign country, uh, I'll stand at the door and introduce myself to everybody. And if there's a nearby whiteboard, I'll offer to write their name upside down and backward on the whiteboard <laughs> just, for, just for grins. And uh, that's always fun. That's great. Crazy. Uh, so far, no one has wanted to hire me for that skill. But I think what it tells you is that my visual and spatial skills are different from most people. So just different. I don't know, better or worse, they're just different. So this well, is uh, the uh, benefit of not doing user experience design. It would all be upside down and backwards. <laughs> I think I could get a job working as a waitress at, uh, what's that Italian restaurant that has you has the waiters write their name. Macaroni Grill. Macaroni Grill. I think I could get that job. <laughs> um, okay, well, I really enjoyed chatting with you guys. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. And if you have any other questions about your careers, that's what I love helping people with. I really do. And uh, I'm happy to help you. Uh, think about your career and your future and happy to help you get it, get the best career you can. And most of you guys know Amit and I worked with Amit when he was getting this group started. I mentored him. So that was a long time ago. So thanks for inviting me and you can find me uh, lmartinich at gmail.com, lmartinich at ieee.org. Uh, and you can find my website, which is competitivefocus.com. And you can read lots of articles that I've written and lots of workshops that I do. And I will, and I, let's see, uh, Rachel and Nupur, I will uh, get in touch with you guys uh, when we start having in-person meetings again to invite you to those um, because there's always something fun to learn. Thank you. Plus free food, free drinks. So, <laughs> Okay. Thank okay. you for the wonderful talk. It was amazing. Yeah. Okay. And, and you guys can learn. You don't need PowerPoint to give a good talk. Yes. Okay. <laughs>